we were confident in our own arrogant way, admitting that we could win over any odds, whatever they might be. The South Pacific, June 1942. An outnumbered U.S. Navy fights for survival at the Battle of Midway, one of many steps on the long, bloody road to Tokyo. Everyone was willing to fight. If I was assigned to an attacking unit, I was happy. That's how I felt at the time. December 7, 1941. Much of American air power in the Pacific is destroyed in a few violent hours. Wake Island falls. The Philippines are overwhelmed. Singapore and Malaya go under. Japan is fully mobilized and confident of victory. It has 10 aircraft carriers in the Pacific. The Americans have only three. I look back with great bitterness about one big thing, and that is why. Why was this country so unprepared when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Why? We had obsolescent aircraft, we were cannon fodder, we had to go out with pilots just out of flight training. Why were we so unprepared? Luckily, the American carriers are at sea during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And in the months to follow, carrier production increases dramatically. The flight decks and holds of these carriers are home to the pilots in the Pacific. The men who fly from carrier decks are a band of brothers, a special breed. You build a camaraderie, I think, in carrier aviation that you will find no other place in the world. The carrier itself is your, is your home. Uh, it's, your, it's where you eat. It's where you sleep. You have your ready room. And then you have the sky, the flight deck in the sky. And you leave the carrier, you do your mission, you come back to it, and you come back home, really. Regarding skill, the Japanese Navy pilots had regular flight training, plus a special training. We practiced landing on and taking off from aircraft carriers. You simply had to be a more skillful pilot in order to do that. The Battle of Midway, June 1942. Though outnumbered 10 to 1, America gambles what is left of her Pacific fleet. Codebreakers at Pearl Harbor reveal the positions of the Japanese force. The Americans will achieve total surprise and ambush the Japanese fleet. The Admiral and his staff put together a statement that we are headed for what is going to be the biggest carrier engagement of the war. Our main unit was found earlier than we had expected at Midway. Contrary to our plan, the enemy did not attack our decoy unit at all. Instead, our main task force was severely attacked by the Americans. I saw a formation of 10 enemy torpedo bombers. We attacked them at a 90 degree angle. I shot at them and in the end only three remained. One of those remaining three planes launched a torpedo. It almost hit the head of our aircraft carrier. It missed the carrier but it was so close. 
to get into position to drop a torpedo is one of the most self-sacrificing enterprises you've ever thought of. You had to come in, slow, level, and close. We lost as many people as uh, you'd ever want to think of uh, doing that. Torpedo planes, they played their role. In other words, they drew the defenses down, and our dive bombers were free to make their attacks almost unmolested. And it wasn't planned that way, but the, the dive bombers, uh, they won it, and the torpedo planes won the sacrifice. The Battle of Midway proves almost suicidal for unescorted American torpedo bombers. Of 15 men in Squadron 8 from the USS Hornet, only one man, Ensign George Gay, survives. Commander Roger Melee. During the Battle of Midway, he tries desperately to save the carrier Yorktown from an attack by a formation of Japanese dive bombers. I had uh, a couple of thousand feet of advantage, which is the way we like to have it. But I was too late, and I saw the first guy dive. Second pilot is one who got his hit, first hit on the town. I dived, and I managed to get one of them, but uh, Yorktown had already been uh, hit, and it ended up having to be abandoned and, and sunk that particular hit. There were about ten zeros flying so close that I feared we would collide. Then a bullet hit the fuel tank and caught fire. I crashed into the sea. I looked around and saw three trails of smoke. Later, I heard that the smoke came from the Akaki and other bombed aircraft carriers. The American gamble at Midway pays off. The Japanese lose four carriers, 300 planes, and 3,500 killed. Among those killed are the cream of their battle-hardened pilots, who cannot be replaced. The Americans lose the carrier Yorktown, 150 planes, and 300 dead. The victory is marked by incredible bravery and self-sacrifice. The Battle of Midway is the turning point of the war in the Pacific. The Americans will make the next move at a place called Guadalcanal. The 1st Marine Division lands on Guadalcanal unopposed and seizes the vital airstrip they name Henderson Field. The Marines' only support is a handful of fighters and dive bombers known as the Cactus Air Force. Henderson Field was coming under attack. We had cruisers coming down, we had battle wagons shelling the fields at night, and we were in dire straits. We, we had to fly fuel and food in, or bring it in, I should say, by specially converted destroyers at night and some by submarines. So we didn't really have control of much, maybe a square mile. And that's all we owned. They surrounded us on three sides, and the ocean was on the other side. And then, just to uh, give us a real working over, the uh, enemy fleet came in there on October 12, 1942, and just parked out there and just kept shelling us. He started sometime after 9 o'clock in the evening, and the shelling went on all night until about 4 a.m. the next morning, just firing broadside right into our area. One night we destroyed their runway by bombing it from our aircraft carrier. So the next day we expected that the Americans would not be able to take off. We thought when we went there, there would be no Americans. But actually, when we got there, there were so many Americans. We flew closer, and we could see that the runway was already repaired. We got off, and we really gave them a reception, every one of the suckers that came around there. Well, they knew we were there, and uh, not only in the air, but our... Uh, Men on the ground really gave the reception. And that's what it took all the time. Everybody was dedicated to doing their job there at Guadalcanal, I'll tell you that. Joe Foss's first kill over Guadalcanal is almost his last. They really salted me. I, 
as I recall, that's the one time I think they said there were 250-some holes in my airplane. And right then, the thought went through my mind, uh, why did you ever leave the farm? Joe Foss will go on to receive the Medal of Honor for his valor in the Pacific. All that time we were told that the American pilots were weak, they protected their lives, so in an emergency they would fly away, that was what we were told. However, in actual battles they were the opposite, they were very brave, that surprised me a lot. From recently captured Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, the Americans launch bomber strikes on the Japanese-held islands of Bougainville and Rabaul. Japanese pilots must now contend with the heavily armed B-24 and B-17 bombers, as well as their fighter escorts. The enemy was armed with so many machine guns, they looked like porcupines. I had to attack while flying through a hail of bullets. I always began my attack by getting above them, then began firing in front. My attacks were deeply angled at 80 degrees. If I didn't get them the first time, I dove under the formation and attacked again. During one of these attacks, I was hit twice in my body here and here and couldn't make it back to my base and had to make an emergency landing. Saburo Sakai. On June 9, 1942, while on his way to 64 kills, Sakai bounces a formation of American medium bombers headed for Rabaul. He is later led to believe that Reserve Lieutenant Commander Lyndon B. Johnson was aboard one of the B-26 Marauders as an observer. I attacked the B-26s, one, two, three planes. When they were coming towards me, I shot. My bullets hit one of the planes, and its bombs exploded. I flew back through the smoke. The Americans thought that we collided. I looked back. I attacked another plane, but there were clouds, and my plane and the plane I attacked flew into the clouds together. That was the plane Lyndon Johnson was in. His plane had a lot of bullet holes, but they managed to land. Each time I went to America, I was asked, why didn't you shoot at Johnson's plane first and not the other one? If I hit that plane, there would have been no President Johnson. Sakai may or may not have changed world history, but his own nation's destiny is beginning its long slide to destruction and defeat. The Japanese fight an enemy that grows stronger by the day. Their bases are bombed from the air, retaken from the sea, and denied provisions by American submarines. The island-hopping campaign begins. General MacArthur decides to bypass Rabaul. It will be cut off and destroyed from the air. The relentless bombing campaign lasts more than a year. Takeo Tanemitsu shared the hell that was Rabaul. We were tired. Fighter pilots flew three or four times a day. We attacked several times. Gradually, we were losing weight. We received an injection of dextrose for our nutrition, but our appetite became less and less. The pilots had the most severe diarrhea. Our health conditions were very bad. For example, we were told that our meals were ready and they were brought to us. A bowl of rice was brought to me, but the rice was so black, I thought it was strange. I moved my face closer to the bowl. So many flies flew up. Then finally I could see white rice. We had malaria and fever, but we could not rest. 
If we would take a rest, we would have been called a traitor. So no one took rests. Gradually, we became weaker and weaker. There was no one left in the end. If there were normal conditions, if I were not tired, I could have seen the enemy quicker. There is no question about that. But if one were tired, he loses his concentration and he momentarily loses his guard. A lot of experienced pilots died in that way. The zero that uh, I encountered had to be disoriented. He might have had trouble. I got onto his tail and he kept wagging his wings. My first inclination was, you know, that he's a fellow in trouble. And my second uh, thought was, well, it's a trick. And I shot anyway. And he simply began to smoke, rolled over in a slow dive, and he crashed near the airstrip. In the beginning, the Japanese pilots were called messengers from hell, but we began to be called paper tigers. The morale of younger pilots began to decrease. By February 1943, the starving remnants of the Japanese army are driven from Guadalcanal. New air bases are hacked out of the New Guinea jungles, and the air war continues with undiminished fury. The South Pacific is reinforced with a fresh crop of pilots. Earlier on in the war, we'd go strike someplace for two, three days and then come on back and rest up for three, four weeks and then hit again. You'd rest a lot in between times, catch up on your sleep, play a lot of AC Ducey, sleep a little more, hang around the ready rooms. <laughs> From the stories I heard from the American prisoners of war, that is, their pilots who were at the front for a certain amount of time were given a vacation in an area called New Georgia or something like that. I was envious to hear that. In Rabaul, a pilot was ordered to fight until he died. The Japanese are now facing almost every warplane in the American arsenal. George Chandler was among those combat pilots flying air patrol against the Japanese bomber strikes on Bougainville. The Marine fighters and our Army P-40 fighters were all waiting for him. And here were the bombers coming in more or less unescorted without the Zeros, because we were out there nagging at them. The P-40s and the Marine fighters just tore them all to pieces, the bombers. American pilots continue to rack up impressive numbers of kills. The F-4U Corsair and the twin-engined Lockheed P-38 Lightning are both capable of speeds in excess of 400 miles an hour and prove to be more than a match for the Zero. After the Americans attacked once, they sped away. We chased them, but we couldn't get any closer. We were too slow. Their engines were bigger than ours. They simply outperformed us. At this point, looking back, I think that the American strategy was very practical and efficient. But during the war, I really thought that the Americans were sly. Their way of fighting was not fair, I felt. When we look back after chasing one plane, another plane was already in our tail shooting at us. Their teamwork was very good. I respected the Japanese pilots. If you didn't give them any respect, then you're going to get your butt shot off. They were some marvelous flyers. Sometimes I... Uh, they didn't seem to uh, have a teamwork concept that we had to have. The American strategy of hit and run, a sharp eye, and sheer nerve proved deadly. You don't dare go past an enemy fighter 
or you are instantly the target instead of the hunter, you're the hunted. If he's behind you, I, you're in trouble. As that plane got closer and closer from behind, I realized there was no escape. And I let fly and I could see the canopy just go all to pieces. Oh, no. This way. That way. There was no escape. So I started blasting my machine guns and I felt a jolt as bullets blew the glass canopy away. And when that canopy goes all to pieces, so does that guy's head inside. The bullet came from here through here. Those wounds are here and here. Then I lost consciousness and my plane was spinning out of control. By summer 1943, Japanese naval and air power have been dealt decisive blows, defeats from which they will never recover. America is now firmly on the offensive, and though two years of bloody fighting still lay ahead, there is renewed confidence in victory. <laughs>